Hey everybody. Can, they, can, can everyone hear me without the mic? Is that good? Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and knock the mic then. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. All right, so my name's Tom. Uh, I am an ex-musician. I am a software developer today. And I'm here to talk about how the relationship between the things that I learned in music can be leveraged in a software development environment. Uh, so I'm going to go through a little bit of a background about my life, I guess. Um, we're only going to go through about 30% of it because my girlfriend's parents are here. And anyways, uh, so I'm an AI developer, uh, not just a staff developer, but I, I work in AI. So we actually use uh, natural language components and machine learning components in order to uh, gather insights about customers' data and uh, come up with ways to display visualizations using that data and come up with uh, interesting insights related to uh, whether or not sales is related to profit, which it obviously is, but a computer can do that now, and we work on that. So, uh, I've been a musician on and off since 2007. How many years ago was that? Can someone do the math for me? Wow, 12 years. 12 years, there you go. So I've been a musician on and off for 12 years. Uh, I used to go to Ottawa. Interestingly enough, I did not graduate, I dropped out. So uh, I, when I dropped out, I went to Algonquin and I uh, basically finished up the degree. I started building apps, and over time, I gained enough experience. I finished a technical diploma, and I, I applied for a bunch of jobs, and I took one at Ivy. Um, so what I wanted to get into today is the fact. I guess another name for the presentation could be when arts goes wrong. Okay, I did indeed pursue arts. I was very interested in arts. But it didn't work out. And sometimes it doesn't work out. That's life, right? So what I wanted to touch on was the fact that the way I was educated about music, uh, the basic ways that you have to learn about music, working in teams, working in ensembles, chamber music, for example, wind ensembles, how that can be extracted and leveraged in something called the agile development. Which, as I'm sure a lot of people have heard, maybe not. I don't know how acquainted you are with software development. It's, it's, it's the name of the game today. It's, what, it's the iterative approach to work. It is segmenting work and eventually getting to a point where you can have a final product and deliver it to a customer. So essentially, I'm going to further establish how that there are ways to improve your own efficiency in everyday tasks uh, using those methodologies that are leveraged from music and from music ensembles and from working in music in the first place. So what I'm going to do is start off with a bit of oh. musical pattern. So what is music? What is music? Well, I'm a minimalist. I like breaking things down into categories. Because you can build a machine learning algorithm to decide what something is in the future. That's just a nice thing to be able to do. So music itself is, is, is essentially split into six different things. Rhythm, melody, harmony, dynamics, timbre, there's one more. Texture. Okay. So rhythm is my personal favorite of the drum, actually. So uh, rhythm is essentially exactly that. I'm sure everyone's heard the basic dotted quarter, dotted quarter, quarter note beat. I'm sure everyone has heard a song that uses that, right? It's very similar in in many different genres. Most R&B music today, or R&B derivative music, leverages that. World music leverages that rhythm. It's the same in most types of music, really. And that's, that rhythm can be used in many different ways. But in the end, it's a different type of music, right? Well, that's interesting. I'm using the same thing in a bunch of different ways, and I'm getting different answers, right? Further melody. Melody is how you would, if I asked you to sing a song, for example, you would probably give me the melody of the song, right? So you wouldn't sing, you wouldn't start from the beginning or anything. And it's essentially the inf specific inflections that end up being a lick or something that, you've, uh, that, that sticks in your brain. It's what you remember of the music. Uh, harmony is how different voices can be heard together. Voices being instruments, voices being from people. Uh, dynamics is how loud you're playing those things. Uh, texture is the different sounds of the instruments and how they work together. And timbre is the actual specific uh, sound of the instrument itself. So a timbre, for example, would be uh, electric guitar versus acoustic guitar. They're the same instrument, but they're two different sounds, right? That's what timbre is, okay? 
So right there, I've, I've broken down music into six basic ways of, I guess, classifying this one. Okay? Everything's going to have a different rhythm, maybe it won't. Everything's going to have a different melody, maybe it won't. Right? Everything's going to have a different harmony, maybe it won't. So how do we decide what is music and what isn't? Right? Everything that uses those six things is music. Right? So what I've done here is I've abstracted music for you. Okay? I've come up with a way to, well, I didn't do it. Someone else was smarter than we did it. But they came up with a way to break down music into some way that we can classify it. So if I wanted to come up with an example for uh, a, a computer program that wanted to automatically classify music based on these things about music that can actually be processed about music, I could do that now. I can't listen to a song and then decide based on another song that this song is the genre. Computers can't do that. But what we can do is we can gather that text data, for example. Spotify does this as well. Gather the text data that, that about it and classify that data. So you, moving forward, we can eventually get to a point where we can start classifying music without actually hearing it, right? So we leverage human data for that. Humans like to provide forms of data, and they do things like that. It makes life easier for us, because I don't like doing a lot of work, honestly. I'm really lazy. Really so, abstraction. So, I've touched based on an example of abstraction. It can be used in music, it can be used in really anything. It's, it's the basis of, of minimalism, basically. You break things down so you can understand them better. So, I'll, so a really, okay. In software development, we'll, we'll talk about something called an is a relationship and, an, and a uses relationship. Now, a method of abstraction is to recognize that there are some things that are similar and there are some things that are not. But if you break something down, into its core bits, what are those things? Those, if those are the only things you care about, then you've simplified your problem. You don't have to look at all of these parameters in, for example, rock music. You can just look at the parameters in music, right? Rock music is a subclass of music. Every genre of music is a subclass of music. And every genre of music, every music thing, is broken down into these six things, right? Everything is like that. <laughs> Not just music, really. We can think of engineering like that too, right? In the end, I'm, I'm going to break down uh, what a car does, but in, what, what does a car do? What is its purpose? You can model a car in programming and, and, and essentially get to a point where you've established that this thing works or not. But you don't have to know it. You can just prototype it in programming. It's great. You don't have to build a whole car to know if it works, right? That's what you want to do. You want to be able to gather the information that you need in order to come to some conclusion without actually prototyping and doing it, right? That's so much easier, I tell you. So, abstraction improves pattern recognition. So, I gave you the example of the rhythm, the dotted eighth note, the quarter note uh, rhythm. Once you recognize that that's used everywhere, you start to see the pattern, right? So, breaking the song down into its individual parts can improve classification accuracy, it's true for everything. And I'll give an example in software. So, in software, um, these inheritance hierarchies can get particularly complex. And what you really want to ensure is that you are not creating such a complex hierarchy that it becomes so difficult to discern what is happening that you've basically lost all hope for what it's supposed to do. And if someone else needs to review your code in the future, it becomes particularly difficult to understand what the heck's going on, right? So. You want to be especially careful about how complex your abstraction hierarchy gets so that other people who you're working with on your team can understand what exactly it is you're doing two years from now. Let's say you left the company. Let's say something came up. Maybe you're going on vacation. You want to be able to look at this thing and for it to be as simple as possible and to move on from it, right? So that you can fix the problem, so on and so forth. So I want to get into musical ensembles. And I'm going to start touching on agile methodology. Musical ensembles essentially work in an agile way, naively, but it can work like that. So chamber music, for example, is a group of, is a small group of people. It can be any instruments, any voices. Um, in, for example, in my high school, I played in a number of percussion chamber music uh, groups, uh, where you have uh, marimbas, allophone, and uh, other non-melodic percussive instruments playing and doing things and performing. So 
that can be considered something called a squad in agile methodology. It's a small group of people whose purpose is to satisfy some requirements in the end, some task. Further, the example of wind ensembles would be a group of squads trying to achieve some goal. And that goal, of course, is a performance, a successful performance for the people that you work there, you're performing for, right? So the, breaking these things down into these little core bits and do these little groups makes it easier to compartmentalize who is responsible for what. It is very obvious that the wind ensemble, trumpet section, the brass section, sorry, and the percussion section are going to have completely different responsibilities in a song, right? So they shouldn't necessarily work on those things together at all times, but there's going to be some event where they're all going to come together and they're going to start working together and then eventually you rehearse, rehearse, and you get to a point where you have to perform what your, uh, your song, right? So essentially, this, this basic agile methodology where you break in, you've broken these small repetitive tasks into little groups for teams, put them all together in the end, and you've achieved some goal. Further, the iterative approach comes into play because you rehearse, you go over and over again. Sometimes you have a performance, and sometimes you have multiple performances, and you obviously want to improve from one to the other. So you're not going to practice the same things after your first performance. You're going to recognize that you made some mistakes somewhere. You're probably going to practice those things a little bit more, right? This is the iterative approach in the Agile methodology. It is simply, you're going to do something over and over again until you get exactly what you need, right? Further, in music ensembles, requirements will change depending on the context. If you're performing for your teachers, you might care a little bit more about nailing that high B flat because you're going to be marked on it, right? But in a show for kids, like four year, four years old, four year old kids or something, it's not necessarily a requirement to absolutely get that thing perfect, right? But you're, you're still going to satisfy your customers, right? Your four year old kids don't really know what's different about music or not, right? So. Essentially, another thing to keep in mind with the Agile methodology is that it is important to leverage it if your requirements are changing consistently. So, I work for IBM, and we had an interesting experience with uh, the Phoenix um, related to, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to turn to Phoenix at this point, but this is an example of, of requirements changing and getting into a position where, okay, now we have to consider a risk management approach here, right? So, what's Realistically, the case is that if you are taking an approach where you are planning absolutely everything in order to get to some point where this is your customer's requirement, and something changes along the way, you completely ruin the whole plan you made, right? You can't go back and say, oh, well, crap, right? You're stuck. But if you take an iterative approach, if you complete a customer requirement after two weeks, and then you improve upon that customer requirement after four weeks, and then you improve that customer requirement after six weeks, well, after eight weeks, you'll have something there. And after six weeks, if you need to actually deliver something early or if a requirement changes, it's not as drastic a change because you haven't actually necessarily completely fulfilled the customer requirement. You've only gotten far enough to satisfy a certain set of requirements. Gathering that iter using that iterative approach means, oh, you added a new requirement? Okay, well, we can start doing the same thing with that individual requirement while we're improving our software. So, essentially, we should be a little bit more concerned about how we do work. And music ensembles are a great example of that because it's often the case where a squad may or may not do as well as another squad, right? But the performance of one group can cover up the performance of another if necessary. So we should be particularly concerned about how we do these things in the first place. One sec, sorry, I messed up all the slides. So supporting skills in, 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 in Agile are particularly important. If you, for example, are in a band and you want to play shows, no one is going to be working your stage crew. No one is going to be doing the sound for you. And in fact, a good example of this is Steam, right? They did everything themselves. And you know, I want to mention that we should probably give a round of applause to the Steam team here for putting up such an excellent presentation. <laughs> 
But this is an example of learning how to do things on the fly and figuring these things out without actually planning it out. You just have to do it, right? Do these things. Just do them right away. If you get it wrong, they get it wrong. Next time it's going to be better. And that's kind of a mentality that you need to start having, especially in a world where things are changing so fast, right? So I'm going to get into a little bit more about efficiency improvement in the context of the music and the context of the software development. Uh, essentially, I'm going to talk about how you can optimize and increase the likelihood of success when you're doing something. So practicing music is, is, is a way to do that. We all practice in certain ways. We all have different ways of practicing. The reality is you're going to have different method, you're going to have different success rates based on how you practice. And the way you practice might not be the way someone else that practices. If it is, great. If it isn't, that's something you should consider, right? The general case isn't necessarily going to apply to you. And you need to iteratively figure out what is best for you. You can't just assume that because I've been taught that this learning pattern is coolest or best that I should use it. You need to try. You can't just let someone tell you what is best for you, right? I made that mistake when I was young. I followed uh, the mechanical engineering path actually when I was in Ottawa because it was particularly, uh, it was a concern of my parents to uh, ensure that I was going to succeed. And they thought, oh, you better get into something like medicine or engineering. But it didn't really end up working out nearly as well as I wanted to. I wasn't nearly as interested in it because prototyping was very slow. And I couldn't iterate over my solutions over and over again. I got bored. And then my marks started to slide. So I decided, OK, well, I got to do something different. I got to move on. And I did, I moved on. The same way I moved on from music, when I recognized that although it was a, it was a ton of fun, and I really enjoyed it, and we had some great success. We opened for bands like Bill Scarlet, we opened for bands like Walk Off the Earth, uh, Great Big C, uh, Stephen Page from the Bare Naked Ladies. We had a lot of fun doing that. It was, it was, it was really entertaining, but in the end, I, I started to realize that this wasn't really what I wanted to do, and I wanted to change that up. So I took an interim approach to my life, I highly recommend people take a look at what they're doing and, and think about whether or not that's actually what they want to do. And, and whether or not that's, it, it's not just someone else telling you that you should do those things, right? So touching back on efficiency improvement. When I was uh, working at the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, I was given the opportunity to work uh, alongside a team in the process improvement department. And I was given the opportunity to learn about efficiency improvement, but specifically a methodology called Lean. And using Lean methodology, you could supposedly improve the efficiency of all of your processes. So from the musical perspective, the way you practice could be a way that you analyze using Lean methodology and break down these things into little tasks and understand what exactly is creating value for you. Okay, so for example, if I am practicing in a certain way and I can map that process on a big board with a bunch of boxes and arrows, I'll be able to look at it and say, what is actually helping me succeed? What is actually helping me get better at music? Is it the time I spend walking from one end of the room to the other to my drum set? Is it the time that I go and eat when I'm taking a break? No, obviously not, right? But in the end, you will see what is creating value. But what is value to you, right? Value is what affects the make or form of the deliverable. Non-value is what doesn't. And sometimes there's something called non-value but added and but necessary, which is a task that you don't really need, but in order to do something that is value added, you need this non-value value task, right? So if you map your process, you need to isolate what is value added and what isn't. And it's really simple. There's, a, there's, a, there's actually a, a prescribed way to do this. And it's called Tim Wood. Transportation, inventory, motion, waiting, overproduction, overprocessing, and defects. When you map your process, for example, the way you practice. You should take a look at how you're practicing and think, are the things I'm doing categorized in any of these seven ways? 
If you abstract away all of the things that don't matter and all of the things that do, what is providing you value? Right? So, the, I, I've given an example already moving from one end of the room to the other, which would be emotion waste. Right? Another waste would be a defect waste. Like, let's say you broke your drumstick, but you keep playing with it. There's something wrong there. You don't do that, right? And this is kind of obvious, but that's something you need to consider if in the process, for some reason, you're using a broken drumstick. Stop doing that, right? Overproduction and overprocessing. Overprocessing is particularly important. If you are trying to achieve a goal, there's no need for you to go above and beyond if your requirements are set. And you don't need to go any further than that. And in the business world, in software development, and in music, you need to keep that in mind when you're trying to come up with a way to deliver something to our customers. Uh, a great example of, that I brought up already is playing for kids. They're the pro you don't want to over-process and practice so much for this performance for, for little kids, because they're going to be absolutely satisfied with whatever you give them, basically, right? So, keeping these little things in mind can, can improve absolutely anything in your life realistically. And I leverage these skills in the software development field. Uh, number one, through pattern recognition, recognizing that, uh, for example, in music, there are layers, and you can actually classify these things simply. In software development, you need to do the same thing when you're at work. When you're trying to investigate a defect or a problem in, a, in a software, it is very likely that you will have absolutely no context, no history, no understanding of what the heck is going on. And you need, to, you need to reverse engineer what's going on. You need to understand how you're going to do that, right? Well, it's, it, pattern recognition is particularly helpful in, the, in this case. Abstraction is particularly helpful. You only care about exactly what you need to solve. If something else comes up and you realize, oh, there's another problem. Then there's another problem. But these problems aren't related. They don't have anything to do with the specific problem. Then you put them away, put them on the side, and don't touch them until you know that they're related, right? And you know, most of the time they're not. So scoping out your problem is particularly important. In the end, using these skills, agile methodology, for example, lean methodology, for example, everyone's really done this at some point in their life. You're going to start hearing these buzzwords a lot more when you get into the work uh, when you get into the workplace. And it's going to be very important to be able to explain to people that you've done these things before. And if you haven't actually had any experience in the workplace where you've done this, you need to be able to convince people that you have. And leveraging examples like this in your previous life, for example, my previous life in music, or my uh, summer student jobs, or my current employment, you need to be able to abstract away the things that your potential employer is going to care about so that you can move forward in your own career. So in the end, I, I landed a job at IBM. I'm a software developer now. I've had a, a really long, interesting journey related to uh, that, that leveraged an iterative approach that changed my life, really. It is, every, every single step in my life was a complete change. There was just nothing that was similar to anything that I did. So I had to look at what was similar and get better at those things and realize, OK, there are these similarities in these things. I need to get better at So in the end, I really, I really want to make sure that everyone is aware that it is so particularly important to ensure that musical education and artistic education is, is, is still provided for kids when they're growing up. Because I tell you, I was, I was a hell raiser when I was young. I didn't do very well in school. I was I actually had a lot of trouble focusing, paying attention to things. But that musical education gave me the background I needed so that I could recognize, so that I could recognize A, that it wasn't for me really, but B, it gave me the background required so that I could apply for jobs in a factory. And then after that, I started building military vehicles. And then after that, I started working at the nuclear labs. And then after that, I started working as a software development student. And then I ended up with my job at IBM where I am today. So in the end, abstraction is particularly important. Remember that what you're looking at isn't necessarily the whole picture or it's too much of the picture. Break those things away and only isolate exactly what you need to do. Remember to compartmentalize your work. Don't give yourself huge tasks that are completely unreasonable. If you're working in a student group, for example, don't, don't expect that everyone is going to meet your incredibly high standard. Work with what you have. Talk to your team. Recognize that this person's probably not going to actually fulfill their needs or your needs. 
But how are you going to work with that? You have to. There's no way around it. You can't just do it for me. Well, you could, but I wouldn't condone that. Bad. So these little principles are particularly interesting and important to remember for your whole life. I've done these things. They've worked out particularly well for me, and I, I really feel that it's important that everyone recognizes that improving that those little, uh, making those little efficiency improvements in your life can offer substantial, extravagant improvements simply because you cut out something you don't even need to do. Thanks. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.